Back in Silicon Valley, we're sort of, you know, there's a group of people who are getting really interested in this because we've got new technology to analyze materials. And it's, it's hard to do, okay? And it's only now that we've really got equipment, scientific equipment that can, can really look at this. I mean, materials are the same throughout the universe. I mean, iron from Mars is just like iron from, you know, from the Earth. The isotopes, they would be the same ones in outer space when they are on the Earth. Okay. Um, what could change would be if somebody was altering artificially the ratio of the isotopes within the elements. So it gets pretty complicated. There is the novel of the Strogatsky brothers, Hard to Be a God, in which the storyline follows Anton, known by his alias Ramata throughout the book. As an undercover operative from the future planet Earth, he is an observer on the alien planet society that is stuck in the Middle Ages. He has been eventually uncovered by the Prime Minister of the Kingdom, who recognized him as an imposter, and that there might be some supernatural power behind Ramata, because Ramata's gold is of impossibly high quality. In our case, such impossibly high quality could be discovered in UFO alloys. What was found was that one of the components of the magnesium, one of the isotopes of the magnesium, was way over what it would be in nature, in the natural magnesium, which means somebody took it apart and reformulated the magnesium. She neared yes. at the atomic level for, say, 1954, at a level where our technology hadn't evolved to the point of, for example, separating the isotopes. We're doing a survey of all the samples that we have from a number of crashes like Roswell. Roswell was not unique. It was not unique in New Mexico, and now we have, we have samples from Europe, we have samples from South America. Obviously, somebody could take you know, common elements refine the isotopes and put them back together. Um, the, of course, that was done for the atom bomb, you know, it would, between different isotopes of uranium. So if we find that some of those samples have been altered, that's a revolution because it means that there is somebody somewhere, either on Earth or off planet, who has a technology to do that for a particular purpose. If we find that, that's a revolution. If you're talking about an advanced material from an advanced civilization, you're talking about something that I'll just call it an ultra material, right? It's something which has properties where somebody is, is putting it together, again, at the atomic scale. So we're building our world with 80 elements. Somebody else is building the world with 253 different isotopes. It almost sounds like a technology straight from the Star Trek movie, the famous replicator machine that can create and recycle things. In the real world, though, Imperial College London physicists have discovered how to create matter from light, a feat thought impossible when the idea was first theorized 80 years ago. But before them, it was nuclear engineer Dr. Takaki Matsumoto who discovered a nuclear collapse which was induced by the electromagnetic force in the laboratory during studying the mechanisms of so-called cold fusion phenomena. A special formation of hydrogen clusters called micro-ball lightning were found to directly enable electronuclear collapse that allowed completely broken materials by electronuclear reactions to be regenerated again to thin tubes and films of conventional elements, such as carbon, oxygen, and iron. He called this process electronuclear regeneration. You might even be able to use this technology to, um, with a computer to 3D print from whatever junk you can find, um, you know, anything you want by changing the, dialing up and down the coherent matter state and ejecting pul either pulses or conti continuous beams. So you would, you would go to, I don't know, a bit of dead space and you would build your spaceship out of the energy that you are condensing from the coherent uh, uh, condensate of cold neutrinos in the cosmos. So you wouldn't actually need to mine anything. The remarkable point is, as Dr. Matsumoto wrote, 
that electronuclear collapse-related phenomena could take place widely in the natural environment. And by controlling it, by controlling the breaking and making matter from the proto-matter state, you might be able to 3D print anything with any element you want. If this or similar technology is used to build dense vehicles that we observe, then some UAP might be using the metal as a part of smart programmable overcoat to perform some specific tasks. But there's more to it. Even though any plasmoid reconnaissance and surveillance powers would not need to be operated by anyone, very often some beings reported inside of various UAPs and discovered the electronuclear collapse principle would make it possible to create them on demand. And when you got it to a level of expertise, you might even be able to, and you could, you could like change the frequency at extremely fast rates. You could print things like, I don't know, sugar molecules or DNA or whatever. You could literally print an atom and then the next atom to it. And as it came out of its uh, coherent matter state to a decohered state, it would produce, I don't know, a protein. We realize that different tasks require different tools. So, could it be then that a plasma-based life form has means to create robotic organic entities to act on their behalf? Especially since we know that robots can certainly be organic. So, I think that part of what we're seeing here, I mean, look, if you're an intelligence, are you going to go down on a planet with a bunch of angry monkeys who might kill you? No, unlikely. You'll send some intermediary. Well, what kind of intermediary are you going to send? You're going to send something that maybe almost looks like them, but isn't them. So I think, and this is, again, from inside the intelligence community, most of what we think we're seeing are avatars biological robots that are basically put there to be the minions, if you will. If so, these unconventional metal alloys are only one side of the metal. To fully understand its other side, we should keep in mind that UAP phenomena is both physical and psychic in nature. The UAP phenomenon can also deceive an observer by triggering psychic effects either purposely or as a side effect of its manifestations. It's an encounter, it's an experience, but whether those experiences are real or whether or not they're imposed on these individuals as sort of a, 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 an altered reality memory, I don't know. I mean, here's an example. There's a great case, uh, it's in France. Uh, this family, this is just within the last few years, driving down the highway, uh, a mother and two children in the back, they have an open top car during the day, a uh, crowded, crowded uh, highway. They see over their head, through the window, a craft. I mean, it's, just, it's just obvious. And, like, and then she's looking around, the mother's looking around and saying, and noticing that nobody else seems to see this. Okay? So the kids in the back have a camera, a phone, you know, a phone, take a picture. When they get home, they take a look at the picture. There's not a craft, but there's an object, a small sort of star-shaped object about 30 or 40 feet over their over their car. So that's, let's say that that's the object, but it projected an image of something else, and yet that's all they saw. So what, what happened? You know, it's sort of like they, it was a, a projected 3D image of something, but it was only seen by them. So when you start to hear many of these cases, and Jacques Vallée talks about this a lot, that whatever these things are, seem to have the ability to project altered reality into people's minds. I know that sounds crazy. Such sightings could have been triggered by a giant plasmoid in the sky, the form of complex plasma that in fact can be extremely intricate in their structure. Paul Sagan, in his book on ball lightning, often calls them fireballs and presents a lot of bizarre examples of real plasma phenomena intrusions into our world of dense physical matter. Sagan has an important section called, Do Flying Fireballs Think? Here are some quotes. But fireballs possess sensory, energy generation, navigation, and propulsion systems. Since ball lightning is buoyant, 
How come some fall rapidly from clouds like falling cannonballs, rebound before hitting the ground, and then float lazily against the wind or rapidly shoot back up to the clouds? How does a ball know where an aircraft is, follow it closely, and not be affected by the high-speed airflow and turbulence? What possible detection, sensory, energy generation, navigation, and propulsion system do fireballs possess? No other natural or man-made control feedback system matches their incredible behavior. A microprocessor-based system or fireball with sensors that can materialize and fly, then detect electromagnetic, electrostatic, metal, solid objects, chimneys from a distance, distinguish a standing person from a post, and so on, would be an amazing feat of technology. But for a supposedly hot ball of gas, it is not made of semiconductors and wires, to do these tasks of sensing, control, and navigation is not a question for technology, but a mystery of physics. Paul Sagan made one major error in this last passage from his book, though. He implies that these balls of gas are not made of semiconductors and wires. On the contrary, plasmoids can indeed have the equivalent of semiconductors within them. And as for wires, much more efficient means of carrying directed current exists than copper wires. We have to just stop thinking in terms of physically dense matter. In fact, semiconductor does not require physically dense substances like silicon and germanium microchips, and the transmission of current does not require wires of any kind. Plasma equivalents of both semiconductor and wires are fundamental to complex plasmas, especially to plasma crystals. And it appears some fireballs or lightning balls are indeed complex plasmas and can be full of internal cells, semiconductor regions, and filamentary current carriers galore. Ken Shoulders, in the part of his article titled Plasma Machines, wrote the following, quote, This is the most fantastic tale. I will discuss how to make an intelligent organization without any parts at all. It may turn out that we will not be able to see the machine, not because it is small, but because it is not very dense. If the machine resembles anything, it would most resemble a plasma, the fourth state of matter and the most abundant in the universe. A complete machine could be built on this principle. We will enter a zone of electronic construction technique where normal laboratory apparatus will diminish and new tools fashioned in a bootstrap manner will become increasingly electronic vortex-like. This is the precursor to true electronic manufacturing, where no mechanical or chemical tools are needed to make an all-electronic device. Internal structure self-organizes and emerges from dusty complex plasmas, and some of the lightning balls are probably of that category of plasma. And in line with discovery of complex dust plasma in space known as Kordelewski clouds, such complexity can be to the extent that is required for inorganic life, the subject that we only relatively recently start to think about. Here is what Ken Shoulders wrote about it in his article. Quote, All life as we know it is based on atoms. This monopoly ended on Earth recently with the discovery of the binding force responsible for the electromagnetic vortex effect. If such a pure electron embryo had emerged, even as recently as 100 years ago, its high evolutionary rate would have already surpassed us in every desirable aspect. Homo sapiens would be no match for Electronus rex. A stronger broth, comprising the binding energies of the EVO, has been available here all along, and probably long before biological substance was available. I mean, whatever it is, it's clearly been here for a long time. And it doesn't necessarily care so much about us, but it, uh, in terms of, you know, if it wanted to wipe us out, it could. So the next question is, well, if they've been here all along, before we were even civilized, well, whose planet is this really? 